Now, John, I've met you in so many different countries, <laughs> I feel as though I've known you forever. And there's, we, we as a team have, from Mancal have been here for a week now, and we feel this has been a very significant week in September 2014 when we've been here in Hong Kong. But there's some questions that we would like to ask that have come out of, out of this week. And I've been asked these questions. I said the person to answer these questions would be John Greenwood. So here, here we have you. Now, first of all, um, during the Hong Kong's currency crisis in, in 1983, you proposed a fixed currency rate locking the Hong Kong dollar in to the, with the US dollar. Now, that was 31 years ago. Was it appropriate then, and is it still appropriate today? Hong Kong is a very small, open economy with a huge volume of trade and capital movements in and out. It's very difficult to design a monetary rule like stable money growth for such an economy because big amounts of money flow in that you can't control, big amounts of money flow out that you can't control. So it's actually much easier to have a monetary rule of the kind that says we keep the exchange rate fixed and then everything else adjusts to the exchange rate. So in most economies, the economy, sorry, the, the exchange rate adjusts to the economy. In Hong Kong, we do it the other way around, the economy adjusts to the exchange rate and it's worked extremely well and it's still appropriate because even today, Hong Kong is a, is a small open economy by world standards. It has huge volume of trade and an even larger volume of capital movements. Okay, well perhaps we could ask the other question, that we get, well, working from the other direction where New Zealand uh, works very well with the floating exchange rate. How come it works in New Zealand and you feel that it wouldn't work here? What's the essential difference there? I think there are two essential differences. First of all, New Zealand is much more dependent on commodities where the prices move up and down in line with uh, world commodity prices. So New Zealand, if the commodity prices go up, it's better if New Zealand's currency strengthens in line with that. And New Zealand people benefit from that. But Hong Kong is purely manufacturing and services. That's the, f the first point. The second point is that Hong Kong is uh, immensely dependent on capital flows. It's, above all, a major international financial center in Asia. So the capital flows uh, dominate the trade balance. They are far, far bigger, I mean, te tens, hundreds of times larger. So that means that the, the economy or the exchange rate could be buffeted by these huge forces if we didn't have the exchange rate. In New Zealand, the capital flows are much, much smaller. So New Zealand is much less vulnerable to those kinds of pressures. So both because it's small and open, but especially because Hong Kong has the capital flows, it's better to have a fixed rate. Okay. Now, John, if, if Hong Kong dollar was going to be fixed to something, why not fix it to the renminbi in, in, on the basis that China has, has, is, is much more influential on Hong Kong than, uh, than the US. Well, that's true. China is becoming more and more influential. Uh, it's now the second uh, largest economy in the world, and it's having an increasing influence on Hong Kong. But there's one big problem with the renminbi, which is China's currency, and that is it is not convertible. That, that's to say that people can't freely move renminbi into or out of China. And Hong Kong's uh, markets and exchange rate mechanism depend very much uh, on the free flow of capital as well as goods and services. It's a bit like the, the gold standard or the silver standard, except that we use the US dollar. So the Hong Kong dollar and the US dollar uh, are kept together by forces of arbitrage and competition, but that can't operate vis-a-vis -vis an economy where the uh, 
uh, inflows and outflows are rigidly controlled by the People's Bank of China uh, and the State Administration for Foreign Exchange Control. Okay. Now, this is an interesting one because it, it, there are some implications for uh, the, some other aspects of the economy that, uh, that, uh, that, that flow from this fixed exchange rate. So sure. tell us, you've told us about the advantages, what are the, what are the disadvantages? Well, if you fix your exchange rate, everything else has then got to adjust to that fixed exchange rate. And the problems arise when shocks occur. Because those many economies, for, for example, if, if uh, the oil price moves sharply upwards or downwards, um, economies with floating exchange rates can absorb that shock by allowing their exchange rate uh, to take uh, the pressure. The economy doesn't have to, to, to change very much. But in a fixed exchange rate system, those pressures will be transmitted directly through the exchange rate to, on, into the domestic economy. So what we have found, I'm speaking as a member of the currency board of the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, is that in order to run the economy successfully and Cushion, those, cushion Hong Kong against those kind of shocks, it's necessary uh, for the, uh, the, the financial system, uh, the banks, um, the monetary authority, and so on, to have built-in uh, cushions. So our, our banks are very well capitalized. Um, we have to, we ensure very tight supervision. Uh, we uh, ensure that uh, households and companies don't become over leveraged uh, and uh, we maintain budget surpluses on a, so a sustained basis on, on average over the business cycle uh, so that the kind of pressures which caused countries like Argentina to get into difficulty wouldn't, will never arise here. So basically what I'm saying is that if you you maintain a fixed exchange rate, uh, you must be prepared to have um, uh, shock absorbers built in to your various institutions so that when shocks occur, you can absorb them but still keep on growing. Okay. Now, I'm not sure how many people have asked me this, this week of how come the fixed exchange rate works, appears to work so well in Hong Kong, but appears to be a complete failure in the Eurozone. What, what, this is a, the, and and, and, and sure. I think you're the guy to answer a question like that because John is a uh, chief economist of Invesco, an, an international company, and you've got a, an, an incredible overview of every 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 country in the in the world in that sense. So the, the eurozone just doesn't seem to have worked is it, with the currency. Well, let me let me put it this way. If you operate a fixed exchange rate mechanism for your economy, everything else has got to be capable of varying. So wages, uh, prices, the structure of industry, uh, all these things have got to adjust because there's no other way that the economy will adjust. So you need a high degree of internal adjustment and flexibility. If you don't have that, uh, then you have problems. Another element of that, for example, is um, in, in the labor force, you want to have a minimum amount of unionization because that unions tend to make w wages rigid. Um, you want to have a minimum amount of a minimum welfare state because high welfare payments tend to make the economy sort of rather, again, rather rigid and slow moving. So if you now apply that model to Europe, mm. Europe has a fixed exchange rate internally, but it doesn't. Ha it has very limited labor movement across borders. It has high levels of unionization, high levels of welfare payment, uh, and so on. And these things make the ability of European economies to adjust to the fixed exchange rate very slow. And therefore, what has happened over the last decade or so is that debt has built up in some of the countries while uh, the economic changes 
or the adjustments were not occurring. And then when things reach a critical point, a crisis has, has developed. So the key lesson is that if you go with fixed exchange rates, you must maximize flexibility and adjustability in all other respects. But if you don't do that, then you're liable to have problems. And I think Europe falls into the second category. Hong Kong is in the first category. Okay, the only thing left to be flexible in the, in the Eurozone is unemployment, I guess. I suppose so, yes. <laughs> so that's a, that takes the full impact of it. Sure. John, thank you very much oh, you're for welcome, spending Ron. time with us. It's Good. a real pleasure to catch right. up with you again. Good. Thanks okay. a lot.